Hello, I'm Sandra Gilman, chairman of the American Theatre Wing, with our board president, Doug Leeds. Welcome to today's program. Working in the theatre brings together everyone, from performers and directors to playwrights and producers. It gives all of us a rare opportunity to see the people who create theatre engage in conversation with one another. With more than 850 guests during the 30 years that these programs have been on the air, working in the theatre allows all of us to hear from the people behind the characters, the stories, and the productions that draws each of us to the theatre. We hope you'll enjoy today's edition as we share yet another unprecedented forum for a meeting of theatrical minds. And we'll be back later to tell you more about the work of the American Theatre Wing. But right now, please join us for Working in the Theatre. One is a cartoonist, one is a television comedy producer, and two have their roots in rock and roll. And now all of them share one thing in common, musical theater. Hello, I'm Ted Chapin for the American Theater Wing, and today we're going to talk about how these four people made the leap from their day jobs to the Broadway and off-Broadway stage. Our guests today are David Jabberbaum, songwriter of Cry Baby, Ben Catcher, librettist and cartoonist of Slug Bearers of K. Roll Island, Heidi Rodewald, composer of Passing Strange, and Stu, composer and lyricist of Passing Strange. Welcome, all of you. Um, since, since this program, as, as we say, is of people who are not normally every day in the musical theater, um, we're, you're a little bit in a different world. So I thought I'd start with asking David, when you started your career, was it a sort of two-track television and musical theater, or did you? No, I've been on two tracks really ever since um, in college. I you know, wrote musicals for Hasty Pudding uh, at Harvard. I was on Lampoon as well, and from then I've really been trying to pursue both those tracks at the same time, and I've just, you know, a combination of, of circumstance and, and, and good luck and ability, I've been able to get to a point where I'm able to do that now. I mean, The Daily Show is by definition a daily show. Every day we, we produce a show, and it's a, it's a sprint. And this is a, a marathon, um, but the marathon is just about over now, so it's, it's very gratifying. Ben, I, I wanted to ask, since you are a cartoonist, um, and this, the Slug Bearers, you, it, there is a tradition of, of musicals being made out of cartoons, certainly Annie and You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown or two that come to mind, but the cartoonist was not involved in the musical adaptation. How did this come about? I was commissioned back around two, 1999 to write the libretto and make images for an opera, the Carbon Copy Building, uh, more in the new music world, which is sort of yet another, that's another TV show that they talk <laughs> about. Now. But that's a yeah, very different approach to um, theatrics. And then I didn't know what I was doing, and I was just told, write it like you would write your comic strip. It, the minute I got into the theater and sat down with the director and watched it being blocked, I said, this is exactly what I do every day, except I don't use living people and I don't use you know, real lights. I, and um, yeah, it felt very uh, comfortable. I mean, so. And did, did, did you, did you want to be the, the image, the, because the sets of the slug bears basically are your drawings animated. Right. Is that yeah, part then of it? It's my handwriting. So it's not only words and music, but there is this uh, physical sort of emanation of the author, like filling, you know, this gigantic uh, stage. And uh, the, I think the audience on some, uh, subliminal level feels that. Because they're not set pieces, they're not uh, props, they're human handwriting, and then they're human beings, and they both have gestural energy. I mean, I think that's one of the things I like about the way we do, th uh, Mark and I do theater. And, um, 
I want to pick up on, on your comment about it's your handwriting there, because certainly that idea is, it certainly goes for the, for the two of you with, with Passing Strange. Since in, in a way, Passing Strange is, is autobiographical, but it also comes out of the rock and roll world that you inhabit, yes? Yeah, it comes out of clubs, basically. It comes out of clubs. Um, we were doing these shows that we just thought were our normal sort of rock club shows, and people said they were cabaret shows, but that's only because between songs, if you have to change a guitar string or somebody you know, forgets where they are, the singer has to banter, the singer has to talk, the singer has to you know, fill the silence. So they said, oh, it's like cabaret. And we were like, oh, no, for us, it's just a show where I talk between songs, but if you want to call that cabaret because we're in New York, then you can do that. Right. You know, feel free. And that's kind of how the show started to form. But uh, at the time, we had no <clears throat> urge or need or goal to make it into theater. In fact, we kind of resisted when they first uh, offered up the idea because it just seemed so far from from what you did. Yeah, well, I'm an LA, LA kid, so it's like for me, theater is like the closest I ever got to theater was like, you know, maybe seeing Jack Nicholson at a red light. You know, <laughs> looking at, oh, there's an actual live actor. We'll move on. You know, but so yeah, I, theater to me meant people kicking in unison, and you know, just had all these bad associations. And then the public theater said, well, why not try it? And then when they said, why not? That's the, you know, you can't answer that except by just going for it. Right. And Heidi, you, you, you grew up seeing theater more than not. Yeah, yeah well, well it, it's crazy what we're doing right now because I, I you know, I grew up around a, a real musical family. My grandfather did small theater, my grandmother, my mom would do a lot of civic light opera and was always like writing musicals for the church and my sisters were both doing musicals all the time. And I was the one that joined a rock band, you know. And and um, yeah, it's incredible. This, this and now she's thing. doing it in Sopan. Yeah, I'm, I'm on Broadway. <laughs> right. Not only am I doing theater, I'm on Broadway. You know, it, it's it's a crazy thing. You know. Where in the development of Passing Strange did the whole notion of Broadway ever 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 come up? What? Well, we would. It was a joke that yeah. this would ever go to Broadway. We would laugh about it while we were doing rehearsals. We'd say, well, if we were on Broadway, we would do it like this, and we would all laugh, yeah. and, our, and John Spurney, our keyboard player, would start playing something like real Broadway-like, and we would all laugh about it. And it was a constant joke, the fact that we knew, if there was one thing we knew, was that this show wasn't going to Broadway. That was like the constant joke throughout the entire, our run at Berkeley Rap and our run at the Public Theater. That was just a given. We just knew that's one thing that was not going to happen. You know, you know, we hoped to get extended, and we got extended. You know, what I mean, that was fine. But no, the notion didn't happen until the show closed, and suddenly we thought we were all going to go back to our rock and roll lives. And suddenly there were these producers sitting there going, "We want to talk about this." And I still think it's c kind of a joke. You know, I mean, I mean, I mean well, in, a, in the best way. You know what I mean? <laughs> but I mean, it's still. It's still like I feel like we're living somebody else's dream, you know, it's like, you know what I mean? Your joke got very good reviews, by the way. Yeah, yeah but you know what I mean? When, someone's, when someone describes you as like a star, on a, broad, a star on a Broadway show, to me that sounds like a joke that I would make when I was like two years ago, you know? I can't even really hear that sentence or that description as anything other than a joke. Because that's, that's the healthiest way of looking at it. I think so. I think so. I think so. D yeah, just, 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 you know, watch yourself. Exactly. Uh, exactly. It, it's just, it's healthier that way. You won't, you won't get contaminated. Absolutely. No, that's exactly how we feel, and I think that's why we were able to come up there, and you know, when we started getting weird notes, <laughs> we were all able to go. Well, no, we actually are going to stick by our guns, stick to our guns, because this wasn't our life goal. We're not. There's no reason for us to be scared to say this is exactly what we want to do and we don't care what you say, you know. I think if it had been our life's goal, you know, we might have like cowered a little bit or got a little bit scared. But for us it was like, no, we're just going to do this the way we want to do it because we have nothing to lose by doing that. So, so did, did the collaborative people that by the very nature of musical theater you need to take on really come on the project when it was at the public? Well, no. Annie Dorson, the director, yeah. Heidi and myself, uh, Heidi and myself obviously were working together for 10 years before, you know, this. But when we got to the public, it was the three of us, you know, from the beginning. I brought in a stack of papers, we put them down on the table and we started talking. That was the beginning of the thing. So it's always been the three of us and I think it was 
tougher maybe to, you know, put one of us in, you know, if you have one person, you know, that you're trying to give notes to, you can put them in a room with a swinging light bulb and a bowl of caviar, you know, and say, do what I want you to do, you know, change your play, you know, and that one person might go, okay, you know, but with three people, it's sort of like, we just would look at each other and go, no. But it also must be interesting that, that, that in a <clears throat> probably unique s situation, you as the two major creators of the work are also on stage <laughs> so that nobody can get away with ch changing anything. You're, you're right there. Yeah, well, Stu is the one that wants to change things every night. So <laughs> that's what's interesting about that. No, my, my, out, my out in this, the one sort of out that I, the card that I was able to pull in this is, you know, I would say to the producer sometimes, you know, the thing about this is I have to do this play every night. So it's not like I can just sort of sit in the back, do t make the bad artistic call that makes me feel terrible, but then I can like leave the theater and just go away for a month and not think about it. I have to actually do it every night. So that's the other reason why I can't do your note, you know, because I don't believe in it and then I have to deal with it every night. And I don't want to have the job that I go to be hmm. a living help. So you know, that's kind of an out. Rock singers can pull that stuff right, all the right. time, like, hey man, it's not that I don't like the music, it's just that I can't really sing to that, you know? So I need another piece, you know what I mean? But it was a card I pulled, and it was, it's a true, it's true though. I wouldn't be able to live with going there, doing something that, because I'm not an actor. Yeah. Our producers, like, have never, like, literally not given us, like, a single order cre creatively, not one, in four years. It's unbelievable, I mean, very, very, Fortunate, I know how rare that is, but I mean, they have just let us do what we do, and I, I really what's am, John's, appreciate it. What's John's input like? John Waters has been, I would say, like our overseeing gu guiding angel. He has just come by from time to time over the last 40 years and mm -hmm. seen how things are. He's, apart from everything else, I mean, he's just so smart. Did Cry Baby get put together as a musical in a fairly conventional way? Yes, yes, yes. Um, they, you know, they wanted to do Cry Baby. Apparently, some other John Waters movie had been adapted and done fairly well. I don't know. <laughs> can't imagine what that. I one can't is. imagine what that one was. So they wanted to do Cry Baby, and they hired the same um, book writers, Mark O'Donnell and Tom Meehan, to do the book. But they wanted to get new songwriters, and so they had like an open kind of casting call for songwriters, and they wound up going with me as pretty much the lyricist, and Adam Schlesinger from Fountains of Wayne is pretty much the uh, composer, and we've been working on it for four years, and uh, you know, so it was. It's more conventionally produced thing, uh, definitely. D did you find when you started working on it that, that your, your writing collaborators were all uh, equals or were people intimidated by you? No, it, no it, was very, it, was, it became very friendly very quickly and I think we're all, we all play well with others and we're all very good collaborators and Adam and I's songwriters have a very, very similar uh, aesthetic and a sense of humor and uh, that's been really fun to work with him on that. And you know, it, it's, it's really been a great, uh, Collaboration. There are certain rules for how a musical works. <laughs> now, you, you went, well, you're laughing, you're not even finished the question. You went to the NYU School of Music, Graduate School of Musical Theater. Did you feel that there, I mean, do you do agree that there are rules that you, you should learn, and did you learn them there, or do you I think, think like it's... in any art form, there's rules that you should learn and then to, to know how to break them properly, you know, when you need to break them. And uh, I mean, I think the, the, the most different thing about our show, hopefully, is just the, the tone and the sense of humor of it. I mean, it's not, we're not reinventing the wheel in terms of, you know, the plot or the setting or anything, but I think that the, the tone of it, hopefully, both uh, in the book and in the songs, is very uh, subversive, and I think, I think very John Watersy in, uh, in its approach. I feel like every show has an ideal version of what it should be. And in some cases, it's very traditional. In some cases, Passing Strange being one, like it's not. And it's yeah. just, just a matter of, of what that show, um, you know, kind of wants to be. And Ben, as, as the slug bearers, I, we, should, we should point out that, that I, the, I believe the, the impetus for the slug bearers strip was a, a princess telephone crashing to the ground. Yeah, that's. It broke open, and I noticed, you know, that there's a 
lead weight, about this big in it. But at, yeah. as, as you were putting it together into an evening of musical theater, were there moments when well, either you or collaborators or director you know, would say, which probably has to do with some of those notes, oh, no, no, you need a this here or you need a that there? No, there was no one. We did it ourselves at the ki Mass Mocha and the kitchen, and there was nobody to tell us anything. What you're just, doing. And those were, um, that's, you know, the way we were most comfortable to work. With. We, I direct it with Mark. Mark stars in it like you do, and he plays, you know, four roles, and it's like a, um, yeah, it's a very different thing. And then the production at the Vineyard, um, we sort of decided to see what, it, what would happen with this if actors who are also singers did it. And it's a very different uh, thing. I mean, there's a whole question of how much do you act when you're singing mm -hmm. and how do you r step on the song by distracting the audience with acting. I mm -hmm, mean, that's, mm -hmm. a, that's a bad thing. Yep. That, that's one yep. of the worst things about yep. it traditional musical theater. Because the song is this place, I mean, it can start off as a normal discourse, but then the singer should lose themselves somehow. And then their body should sort of, I mean, it's like what a great singer does. They have to do it. They lose themselves. And that's hard to be worrying about, you know, acting every moment when you're in this state of heightened expression, you know, and it's, I think that's sort of, when we think about bad ideas of what music theater is, that's sort of what it comes down to, ruining sort of stepping on songs somehow because you want to act or you, want, you think the audience won't get it or, I mean, there's a lot of other things, there's questions of diction, you know, most pop music is, un you don't know, care what the words are. And if you knew what the words were, you wouldn't, you'd yeah. prefer not to know them. Right. Well, no, not in a great pop song. There are great right. pop songs where you, when you learn them, you say, this is really great. I thought it was great. <laughs> and then there are ones that where the w lyrics, I mean, probably, you know, the best pop lyrics are nonsense syllables. So. Mm -hmm. But those were the, and so we really, took a uh, change of direction. We went from a self, homemade, self-produced and directed show to I the real way theater works. But s some of what you're talking about is really about, about characters, about, about, r about characters on the musical theater stage. And mm -hmm. I would, I, it would seem to me, isn't, isn't part of the fun of, of creating musical theater to write characters? I mean, in Passing Strange, it's, it's somewhat autobiographical, so, so these are characters that you started with some truth and then created, but, but isn't, isn't the idea, isn't part of the, the larger-than-lifeness of, of, of musicals to, to, to write for bigger people than, than Norm? Well, I don't know. I just know that um, I think you did a great job of describing a large part of my whole process, this idea of, because I'm not an actor and I can't act, but I'm doing what I do in clubs, and I think in some way that in itself is theatrical enough, you know? And the thing about, you said about losing yourself is definitely what we try to do every single night, you know? And I think even our actors have sort of learned that from the rock band that they've been hanging out with, with the last two years, that you can just kind of forget about acting, you know, and just be this human being on a stage, which is really the whole exciting point, you know? I mean, it's not... I, I, I'm sure, you know, of course, you know, Shakespeare and Moliere and all these people have invented these incredibly, you know, larger than life characters who actors want to embody for the rest of eternity, and that's fine. But that's really not the kind of thing we're, we're doing with our play. We're pretty satisfied with the fact that this is who we actually are. Even when our characters, I mean, we have black people playing Dutch people and Germans. So you know right away that this isn't you know, <laughs> we're not trying to pull one, pull a fast one on you, you know, by some costume change or some makeup change. And I think our director, Annie Dorson, is also into this idea of, we are real people up here on a stage doing this piece. King James Baldwin, Queen Josephine Baker. They placed his chair when they stepped out of line. Oh, they own Paris and Amsterdam. 
Amsterdam gonna be mine. He was born again, see the real was in hand. Oh, hallelujah, I'm standing on the promised land. It was I guess with some musicals, yeah, you want that big sort of, you want Falstaff, you want whoever, you know, that big. But with us, it's not really that. It's just, here we are singing these songs. In, in our show, we, we, we have larger-than-life characters that we try to make fun of their larger-than-lifeness. <laughs> Crybaby, the title character, his big song is Nobody Gets Me. <laughs> and he says, nobody gets me, and sometimes neither do I. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. just, a, you know, an ode to you know, the James Dean brooding type mm -hmm, taken mm -hmm, to the nth degree mm -hmm, where mm -hmm. we just kind of undercut it a little bit, but not enough that you don't still like him and care about him, but we just felt obliged to comment well, that, on that. Yeah, well that's what's just, I love so much about John's work is that I think he manages to create characters and create these pieces that are huge, you know, and somehow, you know, melodramatic and all this kind of stuff, and yet it's completely edgy and insane too, yes. you know, you know, I mean, it's, it's, you know, I have set people down to watch like early John Waters films who, people who you would think would not be inclined to like them because they're too weird. But once they actually see the movie, they're completely engaged, you know, and, 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 and Divine, you know, I mean, becomes like this, you know, Liz Taylor, do you know what I mean? I mean, for them, it's, it's all the same. He manages to be both like incredibly entertaining. Yeah. Well, the fact that Hairspray had this amazing edge. commercial success and became a movie again, yeah, uh, with his blessing. I mean, he, they, with, you know, he didn't feel like he was selling out in any way. Yeah. I mean, it shows that you know the culture has moved to him. You yes, know, yes, he, absolutely. He, he's the rock, and absolutely. we've all drifted to him. And yeah, that's, that's great. The sign of a real artist. Yeah, definitely. I'd like to think that there were uh, there are musicals or works of theater that influenced you that that ultimately ended that helped you get to, to where you are. What? Heidi, any, any specific shows that you remember that made you think, oh, I want to do that or I want to go in that oh, direction? No, actually not at all, because I think this whole thing we're doing, even though, you know, I grew up on musicals, I don't, I don't, I love old musicals, but they're cutting edge for, you know, I say this, that, you know, stuff like Oklahoma, they, Oklahoma was doing something new for its time, right? You know, a lot of older, you know, a lot of the, those classic musicals were doing something very different and we're the same way. Why, why would we want to make Oklahoma? And why would, you know, I, we had to be true to ourselves. Yeah. This is, we really held on to what we do. And, you know, I wanted to do something I want to see, and I don't want to see somebody remaking an old musical. Yeah, I'm a great admirer of Stephen Sondheim, but I think the ultimate lesson of his is that you make each show different and you follow your own vision. It's not mm -hmm. to imitate Stephen Sondheim. Right, it's to right. imitate yourself. I mean, that's, that's the real lesson there. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I think, you know, all of us, I think, are, are trying to do that, you know, in our own, in our own. Yeah, you get inspired ways. by yeah. these, by yeah. these artists. You're inspired by them creating their art, not you don't want to do them, you know. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, ben, any that you, you ever dragged to a dinner theater to see? <laughs> Maine? Never, 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 never. We didn't have dinner theater. <laughs> I went to saw some of the tail end of Yiddish theater when I was a kid. I was brought and. Um, and in the 70s, I had a friend who took Drake me to a lot of theater, you know, when you could go out at night and see Woody Allen mm -hmm. doing his own show. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, you know, I, and, um, and then my interest, though, in, in opera and music theater mostly came from recordings, not mm -hmm. seeing them staged. And then if I did, I was usually disappointed. I, did, I didn't think they, they, they were sort of brought down by the staging or, um, and, uh, and it, well, you know, I just didn't grow up in a, we, we, I don't think, maybe in New York there's a real theater culture, but uh, I wouldn't say, no, I saw a thousand movies to one live as a theater. And I still do. I I'd love to hear how Engl especially English, since that's the language I work in, how it can be s raised to music, you know, just cranked up. A I mean, it is music, mm -hmm. but just cranked up a little bit more. And I listen to a, l a lot of things, I mean. But I, I'm not even, you know, I'm not the one who's making the music, just as an inspiration to say, how does this happen? I I'm, glad to hear, I'm glad to hear somebody say that, that they often have come to the theater after hearing something and then been kind of disappointed because that's actually been my, you know, I've heard and enjoyed almost every, you know, Sondheim cast recording, but I can remember 
I don't even remember which one it was that I saw somewhere in LA. And I just remember, it's, it was almost like the same experience as people who grew up on radio. And then, you know what I mean, who just, you know, I had the musical in my head already, you know. Um, I had all these, from the cast albums that I'd heard, I already had all the staging and knew what the characters looked like, you know. And again, this is growing up in LA where, you know, you know, you weren't gonna see the play perhaps. And I didn't even know, you know, I didn't care. I just liked the music, you know. I got turned on to Sondheim through that documentary on Company. I saw that when I was in film school, and I was just like, oh, I love this music, I gotta go buy that record. So, uh, but yeah, all that stuff is just, I have the plays running in my head how they should look, you know, and when I have seen them, it's kind of like been sort of, oh, okay. No, it's, it is the first form where image and, and word or music come together, and if one is not <laughs> functioning at the level of the other, there's yep. this yeah. disconnect, and you say, this sort of ruin. I don't want to look at this. But when it works, I mean, the, the ancient Greek plays were all set to music. Right. We don't have yeah. music anymore. But yeah. like the first plays were musicals. I mean, that's you know, that's you know, music is that's part of the dramatic began. impulse so of the very beginning. It's just hard for it's a lot to ask of anything that it be great visually, musically, the ideas, the text. I mean, it's a lot going on. It's a what do you call it? Well, it's complete a, artwork. Yeah, it's and a collaboration. I mean, if, if everything it, has to, well, collaboration. You know, just adds another, you know, wrench to the works. I mean, it's comp. I mean, you know, uh, especially if it starts at the very be the book is a collab. Everything becomes a collaboration. Okay, collaboration is something that I learned a lot about. I mean, I went to grad school, but also this work at the Daily Show. I mean, I collaborate. We all collaborate every day. A lot of people. Um, throwing ideas out, like dozens and dozens of people. And you know, that, that is certainly something where my training in that helped me a lot with, uh, with Crybaby, because I've, I've become very used to that. I'm very comfortable with it, I enjoy it. And uh, you know, I, I really like throwing ideas around, and you know, I've become not egoless, I have an ego, but I can compartmentalize it enough to say, well, this is an idea, this is a better idea, let's, let's do that. Um, so I really enjoy that aspect of it, for sure. Well, I would think as a, as, as a participant in any form of, of musical theater, that, that's that moment of when is that idea better than my idea, and a, a, a key and important one, I would think. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's, a, it's a negotiation. It's a personal negotiation. But hopefully, if you, if you, it all depends on the quality of the people you're working with, both creatively and personally. And in this case, it's been a very good one. Um, and in this case, uh, everybody has sort of seeded what the best idea is in most cases, and we've gone with that, I think. And I think the show has gotten better and better and better with every iteration down the road. And I think now, I think hopefully, it's reached the point of being mediocre. <laughs> <laughs> and I think now we're ready to get to good. <laughs> Picking up on, on something that, that Ben said about English and, and English being the language that, that, that we all speak here, um, in terms of coming from a rock and roll background, I mean, one of the things that your group, the Negro, Negro problem, Negro problem, problem um, is known for are literate, literate rock and roll songs, mm -hmm. songs that you can mm -hmm. actually listen to the lyrics and, mm -hmm. they're, and, 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 and they're good. Do you, from a rock and roll standpoint, do you tend to start music, lyrics, both together? Does it, and you collaborate on songs, yes? Yeah. Uh, I, I work um, just all in my head until, I'm, until it's done, and then I just kind of pick up the guitar. I don't sit with the guitar and like try to find a song. I just sort of have it in my head, the lyrics and the, and the melody, and kind of wait until it's finished in my head and then sort of kind of get it out. I'm not the kind of guy that sits around with a guitar or a piano very much. And she... Well, I just, I, you know, I, I feel like I'm just this girl in this rock band where I was smart enough to join the Negro Problem, you know, 10 years ago. And when Stu says, um, Oh, you know, I joined his band because I love his music and I love, you know, I, I could have just joined and not, not be writing, I would have been fine. But he, every time he needs something, I go, here it is. You, want, you need some music, here it is, you know. It so that's basically. It know. was important, I think, for this play that we had a lot of, you know, that we shared the music because I feel that the way she, the music she writes is somewhat different from the music I write, and I definitely didn't want this one-dimensional quality going through with the whole play. So it, it helps to have two different composers on it for me, it just kind of shakes things up a bit, you know, gives some variety.
let's talk about actors and collaborate the collabor the part of the collaboration that has to do with 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 performers other than the, you know obviously yourself in it you have an amazing collection of actors in in uh, passing strange and and they're they're getting nicely featured I've, I've noticed when in the process did they come and are they friends of yours or did you are they were they hired in standard sort of audition processes well, the lead Daniel was we met him at the Sundance theater lab the others were you know, we got them normal casting and the normal casting way and you know, it was it was pretty difficult because we were looking for some things that we particularly because it's all black cast, we were looking for actors, black actors to do things that we knew they'd never been asked to do. You know, m maybe back when they were in school or maybe when they were back having fun that with their friends in the basement making theater, but in terms of playing different characters and in terms of black people playing, you know, white German anarchists and you know and you know you know Dutch performance artists or what have you, yeah, asking. We we had a feeling that they hadn't been asked to do that as black actors ever before, you know, and as well as black church folk, you know, um, which they probably had been asked to do, right. you know, but certainly not the kind of church folk that we have them being. So that was, you know, tough. We had to go through a lot of people. Um, we were not looking for, for instance, in the role of the mom, we weren't looking for the kind of sort of, you know, earth mother, magical Negro moral center of the play, the all-knowing <laughs> black woman, you know, who, you know, solves everyone's problems, you know, except her own. We wanted a woman who actually wasn't sure maybe what the hell was going on, you know what I mean, <laughs> you know, and we had never seen that black woman in a, in a, in a play or a film ever, so, you know, we, we just had to go through a lot of people. You know, and but we found who we wanted, and the cool thing about the cast is that they feel the same way as, as we do about the play, in that they're excited to be doing this. You know, because they they feel something new. Yeah, 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 and they're really excited to be, you know, sort of creating these characters along with us. And I basically started writing as soon as I heard their voices. I started writing stuff for their voices, threw a lot of stuff out, and started. Writing specifically because, like I like I said, I'm not a play. I don't really think I think I'm a playwright at all. I'm I'm a musician who just happens to be writing for human beings, you know. And I actually, once I hear heard them talk, I I I feel like my casting votes were all about how people's voices sounded. Actually, I don't even know really. I can't even recognize acting really. I'm not really sure what it is still. But when they would open their mouths and say the lines, I'd be like, oh, I like the way she says that. I can write for her now. You know what I mean? Or I can write for him. You know, and that's pretty much how, how it's been, you know. Was, was Crybaby um, influenced, was your work influenced by the, the actors? Because it was done in La Jolla, right, before? Yeah, we, the current cast that we have, we sort of picked up on ball stages. We have a couple of people who are big, big parts who we picked up like years ago, and some that are, we just picked up like a month and a half ago. And so it's been all, but the, the people that we have, once we had them, it did help establish, it always helped establish, you know, what the voice of that character is. And, and, you know, when we had to write, rewrite songs for that character, knowing who the actor playing that character would be was very helpful in writing those songs. The stars up above shine their light on our love, and the night just like us is still young. And it's long and it's slow, and I need to know. Can I kiss you with time? <laughs> it's moist and it's pink. It's a muscle, I think. It's as smooth as the blanket I run. But it lives all alone with no friends of its own. Girl, can I kiss you with time? It's a great cast. It's, it's a really, really... It's a, good, it's a good cast, uh, and they're fun. It's really fun to work Did you find Ben in, in, in the in the vineyard production of uh, Slug Bearers that that when you found the actors, because yeah, it was pretty obvious who we had who? to use. They just said that's the person, and uh, you know, one or two of them dropped out at the last. Had other jobs came up, but yeah. But did you would, uh, did, did you feel a need to adjust your writing uh, and did? Well, closer. it was written, I mean, it, this was a second production of the show. We didn't rewrite it for these. These people had to sort of inhabit this mm -hmm. thing that 
existed. I, no, we didn't do much rewriting. They, you know, wanted felt it. it. No, they didn't want it. They just felt their way into it. Cha I mean, there was nothing major that had to be changed. Did, so, but did you ever do your show as a, just your band and you sang everything? Uh, and did all the parts? Is that how it uh, we never? No, we never did where we were doing other parts. But we, I have, she and I have done shows where we have, yeah, where she has sung some of the um, female parts. Yeah, we've done that. You know, not so, the entire play though. That wouldn't be possible. But yeah, we've done stuff where. So we've, this show, it's from the beginning. You had these actors. These pretty much from the beginning. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Could, could you ever see you do the, the show being done without you? I long for it. <laughs> so definitely, so it could be. I feel like it yeah. could be, yeah. I mean, a lot of people, I, I don't know if they're just trying to flatter me or if they're just not imaginative enough that say, oh, we can't imagine without you because of the semi-autobiographical nature of it. But I'm like, you know what? Ultimately, a really great actor, you know, can do anything. Well, yeah, but my opinion, I, you know, I think when Stu's out of it, it has to be somebody else that's a performer, you know, doing their thing, and they're not doing Stu, they're not acting. Oh, of course not. You know, that's yeah. what, it's got to yeah. be somebody that, like, What is the uh, contingency now, like, if you, like, uh, we get have laryngitis? For we have you. an understudy, yeah, yeah, we have an understudy, and, and, and he's great, so, yeah. you know, that, we're, yeah, that, that, that's, that won't be a problem, but I, I'm fascinated by this kind of um, point at which in our play, where acting and sort of like we're theater and, and rock, you know, we're acting and singing sort of meet. And, you know, for theater, for me, it's more like about actors are to me all about precision, you know, like, like they yeah. just, they, they, and to me, like rock and roll is more about imprecision and, and kind of swagger. And, you know, it's sort of like you've got, you know, you've got Richard Burton here and you've got Keith Richards over here, right? And I hope our play maybe is the point where those, to meet, but um, I think there is an actor or a rock singer who could be Richard Burton and right, Keith Richards. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Who, who, who could who, who could maybe even do this thing better than me? Because I'm not an actor. I don't I don't bring the acting skill to it. You know. How many? There are four four people who play instruments. Four musicians and then musicians. me up there running around. Yeah. And a couple of words from the musicians every now and then, not characters, yes? Yeah, we're, not, we're not actors. We really <laughs> try to not be actors. No, they, they, they play people in the band. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, and who's the director again? Annie Dorson. And you've worked with her before? And Only on this piece. We did a run at Berkeley Rep, and then we did a run at uh, Public Theater, and we, a number of workshops, and now, and now the Broadway thing. But yeah, she's been there since the beginning. And she's got a healthy attitude towards um, theater convention and that she, like us, never thought we would come here. That's not a, her here meaning Broadway. Uh, Broadway wasn't really her goal. She's more of a, you know, she would laugh if I said these words, but, you know, I think she's more of an avant-garde, you know, more downtown-y kind of director, you know. So, um, it, 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 it wasn't like we had somebody that was saying, no, 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 let's do it this way because this is the way it should be done. You know, she, Heidi always says that you know, Annie hates theater convention oh, yeah, in some she, way. Yeah, she, she, she hates theater like we hate music. <laughs> hates everything. I hate theater conventions you know? in terms of when people from theater get together in a yeah, yeah, room. Yeah, I hate yeah, those yeah, theater yeah, conventions. Yeah, with, with, with name tags. Yeah, with name tags. That I don't like. <laughs> I don't like that. Ben, who, who's the director? Of uh, Bob McGrath. And when he came in early on? or Yeah, I did the this first opera with him. He That's... A lot of what he does is new music and, and opera, you know, these kind of shows that would tend to play at BAM rather than in a music theater venue. Mm -hmm. And yeah, he also, his whole thing is to this modernist theater approach where you don't have actors walking into lights and, you know, l people, their tableaus appear and it moves like a glacier. I mean, and you really, the audience, if they're not incredibly patient, they, they're just going to leave. I mean, it's not playing at all to an impatient or bored audience. It's an audience that wants to sit there and contemplate music for two hours, or difficult music. So, you know, this to him was pure showbiz. I mean, this was like, a, he was saying, I'll do it. I, he can do it. He knows, he study, you know, he knows the technical end of theater. Uh, I like Diction this. comes up a lot, I think, in musicals, because, especially pop musicals, because 
as we said, pop. I mean, that's part of the performance of pop music is that the words become t twisted and slurred and but what's, you know, what's, uh, that's what happens. What's, more, what's related to that is the sound quality in the theater. I mean, that's, that's yeah, essential. Like, uh, even all diction in the world, if the sound quality is, is bad, mm -hmm. you can't hear the words, and it's very, as a lyricist, I can tell you, it's very frustrating. Yeah, I mean, in a small theater, it's not a sound, it's more, it's literally diction and, and emphasizing, you know, end consonants and I mean it's a real it's a thing actors know how to do mm -hmm. and singers right. would feel it would ruin their yeah. their performance they couldn't do it they can't mm -hmm. and it's uh, and that's sort of pro I don't know if that's the only reason but we went with uh, we were sort of went with actors who sing and are aware of um, how to make what they're, the words so, so uh, legible at every moment. And a, and a singer, not only that he might not act up to the level someone expects, but uh, they, yeah, they have, um, they liter literally, it's like, uh, you know, putting a vice in their mouth, <laughs> telling them you have to pronounce this word in this way. They say, that's, I can't, I can't sing it. I mean, so it's a, there is, but These are different worlds of performance yes, style. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, that's a lot of what, you know, Passing Strange is about. These worlds, these, uh, you know, performance art, music, theater, gospel. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and then, mm -hmm. you know, it ends up, it's pop music yeah. that sort of took over a Broadway theater. So it's like a complete, it's the history of performance styles in a way. I mean, I, that's, yeah. I know the one thing in Crybaby, uh, a lot of it's rockabilly, and Adam Schlesinger has an immense background in that, and you know, he's very insistent that within the context of a musical theater piece, it be as true sonically yeah. to what rockabilly is as possible. And you know, we're not conceding much orchestrationally, for example, in terms of like you know, uh, overloading it with yeah. flowery things. Yeah. Um, and it sounds really good. It sounds yeah. really good. I mean, that's yeah. not my area of expertise, but he's doing a great job with yeah. that, uh, as is our music uh, director. I mean, Lawrence English Hankel. language opera uses supertitles. So, you know, wow. if you don't want to use supertitles in a music theater, yeah. you have to bring in someone who doesn't know the words and say, do you know what's going on? Absolutely. Wow. And we do that all, I that's mean, amazing. that's... I never knew that. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, think about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Think yeah. about it. There's but your next TV show. I, do I sort of get, get, get the sense that you're all more comfortable, the, the fewer sort of lines of demarcation there are in the wor world of theater with music, the better. I mean, you, you use performance art, you, you, you know, that th there shouldn't be de demarcations, or do you think there are demarcations that then you can move around in? Well, I try to decide any. Rule. I try to just go with whatever the piece. To me. The current piece, Crybaby, is in many ways a very traditional musical theater piece. It's got songs, you know, book scenes, big costumes, big things. I think the tone is very subversive and, and contemporary. But in the case of this, I think you know that works. And there's other things I'm working on that are much less traditional and much you know crazier. And for those things, I think uh, less of a demarcation between those things is more appropriate. It all depends on on the piece. You know, I, I don't, you, you don't want to set a hard and fast rule about not setting hard and fast rules either. You just you know do whatever the piece demands. Well, I think what's happening with someone like Mark in your piece, Mark Mulcahy, and Adam in your piece, and us, it's clear that in this case, you know, you we have people who are coming from you know pop, rock, what have you, worlds, you know, and I think those people are the ones that. Are, it's not like we're, we're drawing lines, we're just saying this is how we make music, you know what I mean? And this weird thing that happened with American theater in the late 50s where instead of embracing rock and roll or IE street music, that somehow Broadway, like, you know, what is it, Bye Bye Birdie, right? Where they kind of made fun of the Elvis type guy. Broadway should have been begging. We, we do that too. Okay, <laughs> okay, okay, but what I'm saying, Broadway should have been begging Elvis to come. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like there's something like there's something happened where like 
you know, this music was like rocking the streets. It was rocking everybody on the street, and then somehow Broadway just kind of ignored it. And for that matter, at the same time, classical music went 12 tone and ev turned everybody off my too. Completely. Yeah, and jazz, and jazz yeah. Went, yeah. went very free. I mean, my father used to talk about how, um, he, how jazz at some point left the black community and went like into outer space. You yeah. Know? You know, and, and suddenly it was just like for intellectuals and college kids. You yeah. know. So yeah. So <clears throat> all this was happening, right? And 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 it seems to me, it's a really long time between like you know hair, and whatever you want to call, however you feel about rent, you know, or however you feel about spring awakening. It's like, I don't know why there's such a paucity of, just street music, on the stage, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's strange to me, you know, that we have, we walk into this theater and we pay 125 bucks for this music that we never actually listen to anywhere else, you know, and I'm not sure why that is. I think it's know. a hard, it's been a hard thing traditionally to, to make rock music work in the context of musical theater pieces because I think something about the structure of a rock song is different from the structure in terms of a storytelling thing than than the story the musical theater song. I don't know exactly what it is, but right. I mean, it's not like it's not like producers don't want to have rock in there to make money. It makes money. Right, like, right, I mean, right, you know, It's right. not like they're shutting them out. Yeah. Conspiratorially, yeah, I, yeah. I think there's just something about it that has proven difficult to overcome. Yeah, yeah, and it's and it's and it's weird because there's something very telling about if you could have a musical with like based on the music of like say, look, John Lennon. Or like somebody like Bob Dylan, or you know. ABBA. Well, well, ABBA's different because the ABBA show is very successful, yeah. is it not? But I'm yeah. saying like the Lennon show was yeah. not. Right. And you know, John Lennon, not a bad songwriter, right? You would think <laughs> you would you would think he might, you know. There was be one of to, his cat, one pe large piece of his catalog that they couldn't use in that show, which is part of the problem. He, oh, really? These other guys he wrote with from Liverpool. The they, other guys, right? Okay, right, right. But still, are. he had enough good songs <laughs> on his own, yeah. I would yeah. say. Yeah. And yeah. it's like you know, why didn't that work? Now I didn't see it, but I heard a lot of reasons why it didn't work. But the point is, it's not just oh, let's have some good pop songs. There has to be, there, I don't know what it is. Well, jukebox musicals is a whole different thing. Then, I mean, yeah. that's putting the cart before the horse, as many people have observed. I mean, mm. you know, that's trying to retrofit. Yeah. I read, did you see the Queen musical that was in uh, England? We Will Rock You. We Will Rock oh, no, You. I they had to, like, you know, go back and, like, retrofit it to the point where they had to have a character named Scaramouche. <laughs> like, like that's that's ass backwards. Like that that's that's just the absolute <laughs> wrong way to write a show. Yeah, that's and that's Vegas the problem now, with jukebox right. musical. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Having said that, I'm sure it's making yeah. tons of money. Yeah. But do, do you think part of that is because there aren't enough stews in this in the in the world who who don't who don't want to write for Broadway and aren't writing for Broadway and are doing something very true to themselves that happens to be done in places that then, much to everybody's surprise, get to Broadway? Or do you think it's because there's no imagination you know, in Broadway to go looking? I mean, I have to be honest, I don't know how many, I imagine there are, I imagine there are rock singers who, if given the opportunity, you know, I mean, we, we, we got this opportunity for a very simple reason, and that is uh, only in New York City would a rock band be approached by a legitimate theater, you know, and you know what I mean, and 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 say your songs are literate. I think you guys are capable of doing this. There's no other city where that, would, I, 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 at least for us, I don't. I feel that that wouldn't happen anywhere else except here, you know. So yeah, I'm sure there are a lot of literate rock and roll songwriters out there who are waiting for this opportunity. Actually, I have a friend Brendan who's in the band called Groove Lily, and they've also been. Yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I work with and Brendan, they're here. and they're here, and yeah. they're, they've also been asked, you know, for the great reason because they're terrific to do several shows. And they're here in New York, and yeah, that's, I yeah, mean, yeah. that's and what happens. Yeah, so I think, you know, word to all the right. <laughs> literate rock. But, but, but also, oh. word, if, if I may, that, that you are telling a story. Mm -hmm. First of all, there's very much a story in Passing Strange. The fact that it's autobiographical is perhaps tangential, but it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I have said to an audience member, I found it fascinating sort of looking at you and sort of checking in and out to think, oh, mm -hmm. it's kind of his story. Oh, uh -huh, uh, uh -huh, oh it's uh -huh, kind of uh -huh, his. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Which, is, which I think to any audience uh -huh. is kind of intriguing. I mean, it's an interesting story. You tell it in an interesting way. The genre of where it came mm -hmm. from is interesting, mm -hmm. but I do mm -hmm. think good theater will out. And yeah, sort of by accident, we <laughs> we stumbled upon this thing. Yeah, this this trope, this idea that everyone would like at forty six, every forty six year old would like to be able to be in strangling distance of their twenty two year old self. You right. know, at least at the table. You know, or watching that twenty two year old when they made that, you know, mistake, or being up close to that. You know youthful arrogance, that bravado, you know, and be able to just watch it and, 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 and comment on it. So yeah, I think, I think that's something that people like, even if 
they think the show's too loud or something. You know? But I also think that the theater has always been open, to, as, you, as your show, is, you know, to a story that if somebody said, here's a story, I want to write a piece for the theater that has to do with the slugs that are in, you mm -hmm. know, that are in telephones mm -hmm. and, 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 and mm -hmm. electronic equipment and this place where they're going to make, I mean, it, 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 the theater's been, been home to a lot of bizarre kind of stories, and I, I think it's a good thing. But, yeah. but not often Broadway. I mean, That's or, you know, it's usually at La Mama, best yeah. case scenario. Like, I mean, yeah. there's a, the economics of this whole thing is that it is the most luxurious art form you can, I mean, it's insane. You're bringing a band of, and then actors and then lighting, I mean, you're bringing a lot of people to work every night mm -hmm. for this ephemeral thing that can't be canned and sold. It's cool, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's unbelievable. <laughs> I mean, it's, that's, so, you know, off Broadway, it's, it's the economics are such that it's hard to make a living, even when you're in a show. It's a little better when you're on Broadway, but it's still, it's not a, 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 a manufactured object of this time. It's a vagabond's time. world. It's a thing from mm -hmm. another time mm -hmm. when labor may have been cheaper mm -hmm. and <laughs> real estate was less expensive. I mean, it's... Yeah, that's, that's, and then it could happen in a million little places. But and also, technologically, people like the uh, there's a kind of um, control you have when you record things, mm -hmm. and that we're all used to. We all grew up listening to recordings, and ta That's this is everything is taped and everything is edited. And theater is against the technological trend of the world. I mean, it's completely it so. It's on all those counts. It's a uh, tricky thing for you know, odd things to have. When you're spending a lot of money, yeah. I guess you, you say, I have to cut my, the chances right. of this thing failing have to be reduced. Otherwise, I might as well, mm. you know, give everyone the money and say, go home and yeah. enjoy yourself. But is, so, it, is it also a, lux a luxury, luxurious is the word that they used, to be able to play eight times a week before 1,000, 500 to 1,000 people? Yeah, yeah. it's like, it's yeah. like, I like to, call it like, you know, for once they have to tour to see us, you know, right. like we don't have to get in the van and, you know. What future thoughts have you, Stu, for having had this opportunity, which, which we will be doing the for same, a while? The same, the same stupid future thought that everyone says uh, at a moment like this where you feel like, you know, um, you know, the future means, you know, more rock music you know, in, in, in theater, you know, more actual rock music in theater. And that's probably just not gonna happen, but that's what, you, that's what we all feel like. We feel like, well, of course, now, if they've taken a chance on this crazy play of ours to go up here and to be on Broadway, if they've taken this chance, you know, uh, this is just gonna open up, you know, these big doors. But of course, uh, every single, if someone told me yesterday that uh, I think the guys in Hedwig thought the same thing that after Hedwig's right. success that you were going to have this like plethora of you know rock musicals with actual rock bands on stage doing the thing you know I'm sure after Hair everyone thought the same thing after Spring Awakening whatever you know what I mean I'd <laughs> like it to be so <laughs> it probably won't be <laughs> but I would like it to be so and Ben more more strips and more possibilities yeah I mean my life is mainly in print except when there's a show running <laughs> and um yeah, and we're working on another show. And you know, the, the, the uh, sensible thing to do is make a film. I mean, it just, mm. and get everyone together once and do it. But because Mark um, is, a is a performer, the performer and even the writer, if he's sitting there, gets this immediate feedback. And, um, you know, you can work on a book for five years, it ends up on a shelf, <laughs> and then 20 years later, someone <laughs> opens it and says, oh, that's pretty good. Yeah. I mean, in the theater, this it's is there. this, there's yep. this raw every yep. night, and, and, you know, maybe it's just the most gratifying art form for that reason. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah. you'll be yeah. dead. I mean, <laughs> when I'm dead, someone will look at my printed comics and say, it's not bad, but I mean, it's not that sort if, of. If we sold out every night, every night 
literally less than 0.1% of people would be watching our show compared to watching The Daily Show. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's a different experience. The Daily mm -hmm. Show is electrons floating in space, yeah. Yeah. and you know this is a, this is a live thing, and yeah. it, it's just a much more visceral thing, and I see said a very, very gratifying thing. Mm -hmm. And hopefully yeah. more of same for you, more of both? More, uh, more of both. I'm also, I should mention writing a book and a movie and raising two children. <laughs> um, I would hope, I wanted to add to what we're doing, where, where um, you know, people are constantly saying, so is this going to open doors for other people to be doing rock music? And it's like, I would hope what we're doing opens the doors for people that are doing anything that they think doesn't fit into this. Not, not to copy what we're doing, or, you know, I would hope there aren't 10 yeah. plays now that are doing what we're doing. I would hope they would, other freaky people thinking they don't fit in, yeah. doing their own thing. Yeah, that's and cool. making it to Broadway, yeah. of all things. Yeah. Well, on that note, I want to thank you all for, for being here. This is great. Thanks for joining us. These programs are brought to you from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York in partnership with our friends at CUNY TV. On behalf of the American Theatre Wing, I'm Ted Chapin, and thanks for joining us for another edition of Working in the Theatre. The American Theatre Wing has played a vital role in New York's theatrical life for more than 60 years. We stand for excellence, and we support education in the theatre. Best known for creating the Tony Award, our work reaches beyond Broadway and New York. These uh, seminar programs, which are supported by the Annenberg Foundation and the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, are an unequal form for discussions with today's most creative artists. Downstage Center's in-depth interviews are heard on XM Satellite Radio. Our grant and scholarship programs support New York theater companies and theater students. And since we began, we have given away more than two and a half million dollars. Our theater intern group helps young people who are just starting in their careers build a professional network. And Springboard NYC is a two-week boot camp for aspiring actors from colleges across the country. All of the American Theatre Wing's educational and media programs are available for free, on demand, from our website, americantheaterwing.org. Thank you.